Hi everyone, this is Abby Lodmer here with Humanitarian Chronicles, and we are here today with Dr. Mark Beckoff, the real life Dr. Doolittle. He is an ethologist studying the emotional lives of animals in the wild mostly, except for his house, his beautiful dogs and other animals. He's a prolific writer and has published over 30 books and been published in innumerable publications about animal behavior and emotions. And he is here to share with us some of his awakenings about how animals have emotions and have families and cultures and live in societies of their own. And he just finished writing a couple of amazing books that we're going to talk about today. Rewilding Our Hearts is one and The Animal's Agenda is another. And I'm just so grateful that you've joined me today here, Dr. Beckoff. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so appreciative. My pleasure, Abby. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for working so hard to protect animals and humans here on this floating rock. Because as <laughs> I, you know, seriously, as I've heard you say, it's such an important cause because animals in this culture have about as many rights as a couch or a backpack. I'm quoting you. And... I well, couches and backpacks really seem to have more rights. <laughs> Unbelievable. I know. You're not going to find a little lost hamster in the lost and found. You're going to find a backpack, right? It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, speciesism yeah. is alive and well in this culture. And how did you come to be such a compassionate soul and to be doing this purpose of yours? How did this all begin? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I can blame it on my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Good woman. Good woman. She she was a very compassionate and empathic woman, and I I see your green juice. I'm drinking um, with you. We're my mom was a very compassionate yeah. woman, and my dad was an incredible optimist. So it was a good cocktail um, for pacifism and for empathy with other beings, including other human beings. That's so, so beautiful. I it wish... seems very, it's just natural. Um, I used to ask my folks when I was around three years old what other animals were thinking and feeling and um, they just they were never surprised that I wound up doing what I did what or what I do yeah that is so sweet I love that I love your stories of how you would talk to the squirrels and go mm -hmm. out and yeah I, I mean I'd love for you to to share with us some experiences you've had observing animals I mean I know you write a lot about magpies squirrels like can you share with the viewers how what you've observed that show you that animals actually do have emotions yeah I mean you know I spend a lot of time watching dogs I just finished a book on dog behavior so I I, I love going to dog parks and watching dogs and Oftentimes the people are more interesting than the dogs, but but that would be another <laughs> that would be another project. Right. Um, you know, I studied coyotes for years outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, near the Grand Teton Mountains. We did field work there. I studied um, Adelie penguins in Antarctica. Wow. And then I studied um, a lot of birds around my house when I lived in the mountains outside of Boulder, Colorado. So you see emotions all the time. I mean, you see joy when they play. You see grief when one of their best friends gets hurt or dies or, you know, they don't know necessarily that the animal died, but, but is no longer there. Aww. You see grief and sadness when a human being disappears for whatever reason. Um, and then you see all the other emotions like jealousy and sometimes guilt and embarrassment and the whole panoply of emotions yeah I mean it's it's amazing and I actually would love to read a little excerpt from your book I believe okay. it's from the animal agenda I took so many notes on your incredible work I hope I'm quoting it from the right book but you put in the beginning of this book studies of the animal world and you were actually just quoting headlines about how incredible animals are so yeah. you know as you and I both know and we all know I hope by now unless we've been living under a rock animals are deeply intelligent and compassionate and these are just a few examples quoted from the headlines that you cite in your book it's from the animals agenda um, the animals agenda freedom compassion and coexistence in the human age pigs possess complex ethological traits similar to dogs and chimpanzees squirrels can be deceptive chickens are smart and they understand their world Rats will save their friends from drowning. Rodents feel empathy. I love that. New Caledonian crows show strong evidence of social learning. Elephants get 
post-traumatic stress syndrome. Calves orphaned by the killing of their parents are haunted by grief decades later. Fish determine social status using advanced cognitive skills. I mean, these are amazing, amazing headlines, and I'm sure that you've studied these truths in depth in your work over the 50 years, 60 years that you've been doing this? No, 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 no. I'm not that old. <laughs> no, but you've been doing it since birth, from my opinion. Oh, six, I see. 50, yes. yeah, since, since you Fair were enough. born and one, oh. one, two, three in your crib telling your parents how much you love animals. So I'm counting right. that, Dr. Beckoff. Oh, that's nice of you. I count it too, <laughs> but a lot of my colleagues don't. I um, do. Just well, yeah, I mean, the study of animal behavior and animal emotions really, though, is based a lot on, you know, hard science and also based a lot on what we call citizen science. You know, people who watch animals can share amazing stories about them. And also um, just watching animals from your crib or from your carriage or from your little tricycle. Well, that's the um, answer. We need to get more so, involved in, and be in nature and be with animals more. Right. I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, the book Rewilding Our Hearts really deals with personal and spiritual transformation where people are asked to listen to their heart and let their heart tell them what to do, uh, you know, as long as it's good things, of course. But, mm -hmm. um, but, but, but really let your heart and your in feelings reconnect you with nature, including other animals and plants and trees and rocks and bodies of water and stars, if you will. Oh, um, that's beautiful. And that those feelings motivate action. I love that. Well, okay, so here's my question, and, and you know, I believe you have the same sort of upbringing, a similar upbringing as Jane Goodall, which was a, a supportive parents raised in a compassionate, loving home with, by optimists. What about those people who are raised in abusive homes where they can't even find love in their hearts for humans, much less animals? They're abused. So they abuse, and, and, you know, usually it's the more vulnerable, so it starts with animals. I mean, for people who don't care about animals, like the ones who've eaten too many <laughs> and are completely checked out to their feelings and filled with more violence, anger, depression, lack of compassion, for those <clears throat> people, like, how would it benefit them to be kinder to animals? I mean, what can you say to those people? That's a, <clears throat> that's a great question, Abby. So for the last 15 plus years, I've been teaching a course at the Boulder County Jail wow. for, to um, inmates from, you know, pickpockets to murderers. And animals are really the connection for them to the world. A lot of them, their best friends when they grew up were dogs, cats, lizards, um, you know, a whole array of different pets that they had. Um, and for them, that connection is very natural. So what I always tell people, and once again, this kind of gets back to one of the main messages from Rewilding Our Hearts, is, and that is to just open your heart to these non-human beings and, and learn from them. You know, they are vulnerable. We can do anything we want. If you live with a dog, you can take your dog and you could put your dog in a closet and she'll be the happiest animal in the world when you come home. But, but the real question, of course, is, is she really happy deep down inside? So... Basically, um, I think connecting with other animals and connecting with nature in general is really the, the panacea for reconnecting with the world, reconnecting with other humans, and reconnecting with yourself. If you're not connected with yourself, it's really hard to connect <laughs> externally. Definitely. I mean, Definitely. I mean you, can do, you can do it, but, but I think the tightest connections are when you are connected to yourself and then you can um, expand that com compassion and empathy to other beings. Cheers to that. I'll drink to that. For sure. Yeah, I'm thinking this is tea. It's nothing more than tea right now. Listen, it, they're all panaceas for our inner soul. <laughs> yeah. for, for whatever tumult is going on inside of us about the horrible conditions for animals, green juice and tea will make it a little bit better every sip. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I've, read, I've read so much about the areas around factory farms being completely devoid of life. Nothing can live. It's uninhabitable for humans and animals. And for the humans that live around those pig farms in, you know, outside of North Carolina, like yeah. I try to get through to people that way if they don't know what it is to connect to themselves. Like, hey, by the practices we're doing, abusing and degrading and, you know, picking on more vulnerable species on this planet for our taste buds, 
we're actually making it unfit for human life too. It's like yeah. we're interdependent. You know, can you speak on that a little bit? Oh yeah, I mean, I always say we suffer the indignities to which we expose other animals, and we also benefit from the joy we bring to them. I love that. And it's a win-win for all or a lose-lose for all. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, no, you know, if you harm them, it's a lose for them, it's a win for us. But but I don't think it's a deep win. You know, you know what I mean? Yes. Many people who like to shoot animals and hunt them and kill them. There are people who really like to harm animals. And um, in their little narrow world, and it's one we need to understand because it's not a good situation with them, but in their little narrow world, it's it's a win for them and a lose for the animals. Definitely. But, but most people who are wired up, I mean, it's a combination of sort of being wired up normally, but also having a good upbringing. Because uh, the lessons I've learned from these prisoners is that most of them have had horrible upbringings. And while the things they've done, some of them have been horrific, I might have done the same things had I been reared the way they were. So it's not an excuse to a, or a rational, you know, it's not a justification. It's more to say there's a good reason. Right. So like in my class, we talk about non-human animals a lot. I show them videos, they write essays, and yeah. it's incredible how the animal stories and the animal videos bring out compassion. I've had so many of them say it's softened them. Um, I had one guy just tell me that he learned that he fighting wasn't the answer and he'd been a fighter his whole life really wow, and he that why you know you can you can so that you can you know win the battle and lose the war in that sense amazing i i mean that is incredible work that you're doing it's so important i love that you do work with prisoners and i love that you do work with children yes. also i mean the that's children. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's the way to the future. That's the way to a brighter future is properly educating children. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I do a lot of work with Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots groups. And I do some other um, some other work with other groups. But, yeah, they're the, I always tell them they're the ambassadors for the species. And I taught a class this past week, too. They weren't young kids. They were college kids. But um, young. I basically always say to them, that they're young and they're the future. Yeah. So it's not like I'm trying to pressure them and put a lot of stuff on them. But I do <laughs> tell them that you, they are the future. Definitely. And, and as we all know, things have really changed recently over you know, time. And um, I mean, they've changed radically in the United States in the last couple of months. And there's going to be long-term effects of these changes. So rather than bitch and moan and get depressed about it, which of course is understandable. You should use that energy to be positive and work for changes because oh. negativity is just a time and energy suck. And you know, you can spend your whole day being negative, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Totally. Oh my God. I'm just so grateful that you're one of our leaders. Truly. We need people like you at the forefront of humanity and animal animality. 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 Yeah. I'm trying. Well, I'm trying. You are. You're succeeding. Well, I love what you teach that I've read about you, that what you teach the children, which is, for example, it's all in the wording, right? You don't say, well, what about when we go to lunch and we eat our bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich? What do you call it? Ba babe lettuce and tomato. That's right. The babe lettuce and tomato sandwich. And I think it's so important to know your audience like you do. Like, to get to talk to the prisoners the way they need to be talked to to make them more compassionate and talk to children the way they can hear it. And that's like one of my biggest challenges in life and I think you've mastered it is knowing your audience and knowing how to get these crucial messages across that we're not the only sentient beings in the world. We share this planet, this universe with other sentient beings and we're interdependent and when one species goes away it affects everything else and you know I've heard you talk about and Jane Goodall talks about it all the time like when people say well what's it who cares if some little species out in the jungle gets ex becomes extinct how does that affect me well because the bigger animals that we give more you know value to like the chimps and gorillas eat those smaller animals and when those smaller animals are extinct those bigger animals go extinct the forest goes extinct because when we cut down all the trees, the chimps don't have 
nuts to suck on and spit out and replant with their projectile spitting anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, it's all part of the same system. I understand that, but sometimes I just don't communicate as well as I could to get that message through to young people, troubled people. And I'm just so grateful that you're out there doing it, carrying the torch. Well, you're doing a good job. No, I mean, it's, we're, we're all connected. Yeah. I mean, we are all, in, I mean, and it used to sound bizarre to people, you know, when I was teaching this class on Thursday, um, I'd say, you know, what happens in Boulder, Colorado is really influenced by what happens in China and vice versa. And I do spend a lot of time in China. Well, of course it does. You know, not, not only because the web, World Wide Web now connects everybody instantaneously around the world, but really what happens here affects everywhere else in the world and vice versa. So to me, the, the, real, the real big message, too, is that we need to function as a coherent community yes. and work together and stop all the bickering among people who share goals. It's just a waste of time. Oh, my God. There's a lot of egos involved there, and, and, and you got to get over that. Work together. If I disagree with you on something, that's fine. That's it doesn't, fine. It, it's fine. Yeah. I can agree to disagree, be nice, and, and then move on. Well, the problem comes when people disagree about things that affect our planet and animals that we love. I mean, that's that's where I see the problem coming in. Yeah, we can disagree, but when the disagreement is your poor choice affecting my planet and my air that I breathe, that's a problem. So, oh, on, you know, yeah. I mean, but on that note, I mean, you know, like you said, the answer is compassion and proper education and teaching compassion starting from the womb. But, um, like, what do you say to the argument for people who are not yet as compassionate? Like, oh, well, if we didn't kill all these animals, they would overpopulate and kill us. What do you say to that argument? They've been watching too many bad movies. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. They're not. I mean, that's the thing is if we share space with them and allow other animals to have their homes and we have our homes, we have to give in on a lot of things, and they do too. But they're not out to take over. I mean, they're, they're, they're just not. I mean, I know I've heard comments like, well, if we don't do this, then. And I'm thinking, no, just it's our intrusions into their lives and their homes and their families and their friends that force us, that force them into areas where they'd rather not live. So around Boulder, we get bears and cougars, um, foxes, coyotes on occasion. Yes. And, and, and we owe it to them to, to try to exist with them peacefully. And I might not be able to do certain things because of that, but big deal. Right. A lot of the things we do that harm other animals, we could easily not, you know, we could easily put aside and not, um, not have to do. Definitely. So, definitely. Okay. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I so, agree to do that. I take that pledge. And, and, you know, it's the same thing with cattle going into Montana or wherever they are, wild lands that foxes live in and wolves and other wild animals, bears, cougars. These wild animals were there first. And because of the government allowing it to happen, I'd love for you to talk about that. They're just killing these wild wolves and other animals because they're intruding on cattle. Which we right. are over breeding. It's our yeah. problem that we've created, and we're killing the wildlife. Yeah, there was just an article um, in the state of Washington this year. There was a, this pack called the Profanity Pack, and including some humane organizations, by the way, it was agreed that they could be quote removed. They don't like to use the word killed or slaughtered. They'll say called or removed. Um, and so it turns out that to kill 10 wolves, it cost $135,000. This was just published this past week. Oh that money could go to conservation. It could go to building, if you will, structures to keep the wolves away from their meals. I mean, a lot of times, you know, I, I always used to say it's like a steak dinner being delivered right to your door. I mean, we've spread out all the defensive and anti-predatory behavior out of these animals. But the most important piece of information, I think, is the fact that this kind of predation by wolves on livestock 
coyotes on livestock out west is is terribly small, but right. they they build it up oh because there's gosh. money there's money involved. They'll get you know people will get paid for each cow or lamb or um, you know sheep that it, um, you know who's taken, for example. Right. Um, yeah, which which ties in directly to speciesism, which yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about. Well, I mean, speciesism is the prevailing view on the universe. It basically means we look at other species as a whole, so it ignores individual differences. But if you ever lived with a cat, a dog, or a goldfish, or a parrot, or a ferret, or a rat, or a mouse, or studied other animals, you know there's individual variation. It's like saying all humans are blank, fill in the line. Right. And then, and immediately you realize that there's individual differences. So speciesism basically, as it's developed by humans, comes out to mean we are superior, we're the best, and all other animals are subservient to us. We're more valuable, they're less valuable. Yeah. Um, some people but it's a dwindling few will say, well, they don't have feelings or they're not smart or they don't feel pain. And, and, you know, I don't even get into those arguments anymore. I mean, it's, that would be like arguing if I jumped off the roof of my house that I would go up versus down. I mean, it's just a stupidest argument. Um, and then they'll say, oh, you're being anthropomorphic. And I'll go, well, what, I, I mean, what do you mean I'm being anthropomorphic? They'll say, well, you're attributing human characteristics to non-human animals. And I'm going, well, of course, because they have them. Right. You they're know? not I mean, human. You know, they're being characteristics. They're, be, they're, they're animal characteristics. So we're not inserting something human into non-humans. And Charles Darwin and other very well-known biologists have talked about this for ages. So that, see, so there's an example of what I was saying before is if somebody says to me, I don't really know that my dog feels joy when they play. I usually say they do, and I'm glad I'm not your dog. <laughs> because, That's right. Because, because they do. And can you quote prove it? Well, it's, off, it's often hard to prove anything 100%, but common sense and good biology will tell you that these animals, dogs, for example, feel joy, and they'll feel grief when they lose a buddy, human or dog or um, another species. So that would be an example where I just say to these people, because there's so few, fine, you can have your feelings and thoughts about this because the, the, the effect is they detract you, they derail you. So rather than putting out the positive message and talking to a lot of people, you can spend hours talking with somebody who's incorrigible. Right. And, they, and a lot of people do that tactically. They'll, they'll do it um, because they know that if I'm talking to you about something or them about something, I won't be doing something else. Right, exactly. Dis distraction. Weapons of mass distraction. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with good biology and common sense. I think yeah. those are the two things that are majorly lacking in this culture. So you went, you went to school to become a biologist and you had to dissect animals. What was that like for you? And how did you come to want to study obviously I'd want to study animals in the field if I did that but well you know it's funny early on maybe and I don't remember what grade maybe sixth grade you know they do I think they dissect the worm or pith or frog yeah. but it turns out in high school I just said I don't want to dissect Good. and I can't you know I honestly can't say that it was a hundred percent motivated by an ethical point of view but it was definitely motivated by, I thought it was just the stupidest thing in the world to be sitting in the lab dissecting animals. Well, and so when yeah. I taught at the University of Colorado, we started a non-dissection lab. And some of my colleagues, some of my colleagues were against it. Some were f said they didn't care. And some just said, well, that's fine. You know, it will never fill. And the non-dissection labs filled before all the dissection labs. Awesome. So, so awesome. the message there was that the message there was that there's a lot of people, a lot of students who really didn't want to dissect animals and either decided they had to or didn't know a way out. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is just so – I salute you for doing that. Thank you. And you're living proof that you can learn a ton about our world by observing animals who are living in their own wild habitats. 
So you, you don't need to kill animals to learn about them. Well, in fact, killing them and torturing them and keeping them in a cage in a lab is not only not learning accurately about them, but those animals are so stressed that we're actually getting bad science out of it. We're not even getting accurate science. How come, yeah. how come the scientific world isn't awake to that? Or I, to me, it's logical. Like, why aren't people understanding that? One reason is because of the authority of science, and scientists don't admit to that. But my argument is the ethical argument and exactly what you said, that bad science and studies that abuse animals can tend to produce unreliable results. So it's not surprising that 92 out of every 100 drug drugs that pass tests on non-human animals fail on human animals. It's not surprising that major research programs are getting away from animal models to non, uh, non-human animal models to looking either at you know, ethical human studies or using, I don't know, cell cultures and other sorts of techniques. But, but it is interesting to look at the number of um, studies now. I was talking about this to this class too that in, in the last decade, how many studies have been pulled from the literature because of falsified and unrepli- non-replicable da- data. And in science, replication is key. Yeah. I mean, when I studied coyotes for eight years in Jackson Hole, I wouldn't expect you to find the same thing if you studied coyotes around Los Angeles, right? Okay. But if I did a controlled experiment in my lab in Boulder, which I don't, but and then you did it out in California, and and you got different results, or and you or you couldn't replicate my results because using the same techniques, there's something wrong there. Yeah. So I always tell people, science is not going to, in the end, save non-human animals. It's going to be heartfelt compassion. Yeah. Does science make a contribution? Of course it does. But in the end, you and me and everyone else has to decide how they're going to interact in the world and do it. Amen. Amen. I cannot, I've read excerpts of your book, Wild, Wilding, wait, Wild, Rewilding Our Hearts, but I can't wait to read the the whole thing. And yeah, I love what you said about all that. It's, I mean, I've read so many studies of animals in captivity in labs, and I love that study. I think you talk about it in one of your books about the rats or mice who would sooner starve than shock their, their friends in the lab. Yeah. Or, or they would, they would, yeah, they would sooner starve. Like they would get food, and they would, they would starve these rodents for a while and not give them food, and then they would say, "You could get food if you um, shock your fellow mouse or rat." Right. And they wouldn't yes. do it. They would sooner starve. And even under stress in a lab, they knew right from wrong. They knew, yeah. like, they had empathy. Like it's unbelievable. I mean, it's totally believable. I, I wish that's well, why I'm having this conversation. But right, right. But but it's important to have these conversations, and so those data are 50 years old. Wow. So in the last five years, we've learned, you know, for example, that mice display empathy, rats display empathy, chickens display empathy. Um, they can read pain in another, say, rat's face. Wow. Um, but we've known about some of these studies that you're talking about since the mid 1960s. And people don't use them. And that's one of the big things that I've been working on is the um, the Federal Animal Welfare Act specifically says rats and mice are not animals. And people laugh and they'll go, oh, no, no, no. If you go online or read anything I've written, you'll see it says we're redefining the word animal to exclude lab, lab rats and lab mice. Well, they're not plants, they're not trees. So, you know, people laugh about it. But it's not a laughable matter, and I'm shocked that none of my colleagues, as far as I can, I know I'm the only person who's ever called that into question. And when I talk to them, they'll go, ah, oh, you know, and I'll go, mm, I don't know. No, no, I don't. Why aren't you telling the NIH, National Institutes of Health, and the people who draw up the Animal Welfare Act that rats and mice are sent, they're not only non-human animals, they're sentient beings who... We've known for decades that rats love to be tickled, they love to play, and they feel joy. I mean, we know this. So if they can feel joy and sadness, we know they can feel pain. And in fact, 
sometimes rat and uh, rodent models are used to study um, pain to get models for human. So humans, so you don't study pain in an animal who doesn't feel pain. Right. It's but like, of course they do. Wake so the whole, up. The whole, yeah. yeah. The whole Animal Welfare Act is lame. And slowly but surely, and I know this from talking to people, a couple of scientists are making waves. The reason they don't want to is it's self-serving. It's like if they start classifying these as feeling sentient beings, feeling sentient animals, then they're not going to be able to torture them and kill them the way they do like their candy wrappers or, you know, ping pong balls. That's yeah. right. That is right. Oh, Amen. Yeah. I hope to God. You are my hope. You and Jane Goodall and so many other ethologists who are doing God's work here are my prayer and my hope. And I, yes, I am a vegan activist and part of my plight is to get people to understand that animals do have feelings and they do love their families and they do deserve to live a full life and make love and breed, not to be raped by a farmer to get impregnated. That's another video, but you know, I mean, like... I'll just, I'll, it. it's unbelievable that, that people don't understand that. I mean, it's, it's believable. Like you said, you work with people in prisons who had terrible abusive lives. So how can they, how can they have empathy for any other being? But you know, birds and chimps make tools. They teach their offspring to make tools. Bats use echolocation to get around. Fish alert other fish that there's food over there by nodding their heads. We used to think humans were the only species that did that. Right. Birds, you know. I mean, they have funerals. You've witnessed a magpie funeral that was so beautiful that I, I heard you talk about. Adult crows have tool schools where they teach their babies to use tools. Chimps, too. Squirrels jump from tree to tree without falling, ever. I, I see it every day when my dog runs out in the woods trying to chase all of them. She can never catch them. Like, yeah. doesn't matter how rainy or windy or cold or where the sun's shining, those squirrels make that leap. Or how wobbly the tree branch, you know, and humans fall on flat ground every day and sue the city. You know, squirrels are jumping from branch to branch. But no, I mean, these animals are just incredible. And I salute you for bringing light to that fact. And thank God you were raised in a compassionate, optimist, loving home to give you that freedom to live yeah. with your heart open. We, that's, yeah. that's the answer, I guess. Proper, no, you know. I feel blessed. I mean, I do. I feel, I feel very lucky because I know a lot of really, really good people, and a really people, and a lot of people who were not raised well. Some of whom were raised well and just never caught on to sentience and you know universal compassion. I think slowly but surely things are changing for the positive. I really good. do. Good. But but there's and I and I really and I'm an optimist totally, but. There's a lot of negativity out there, and it's hard to overcome for some people. It, it just is. It's, 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 it doesn't work to say, oh, come on, Abby, things will be fine. Oh, come on, Joe or Mary or Harry. No, it doesn't work that way because, because when you're troubled or you're having trouble connecting, you, you really need the support, and, and you need people who are going to be sensitive to the situation that, you know, whatever you're experiencing. Um, because for other people's brains don't work the way ours do. And I'm not saying that's a, it's not a value judgment. It's not good or bad. It's just a fact. Yeah. So um, I think people who can do something must do something. 99% of the people in the world can't do anything because they're just trying to survive. I mean, we're, we're, we're so lucky to be having this conversation. And you're in a nice place. I'm in a nice place. Our friends are. But so many people in the world have no idea where their next meal is coming from. Oh, man. And and sometimes you find them to be the really underprivileged, the marginalized people to be the ones who are trying the hardest to make the world a good place. Go figure. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> well, they're the ones that see that all their grain they could be eating every meal are, is fed to the cows. So when we stop feeding the grains, the GMO grains at that, to the cows and the cattle and torturing them, for our taste buds, we can actually have enough food for the many, many children. I love Thich Nhat Hanh's quote, every day 40,000 children die for lack of food to yeah. make meat for overeaters here in the Western world. 
when we eat the flesh of those animals, we eat the flesh of those children. Yeah. I love that quote. It's a really good way to put it. And once again, um, when I talk to people about their meal plans, it's just the easiest thing is just lay it out, discuss reasons for being vegetarian or vegan. But but in the end, they're going to have to decide. Definitely. I've seen people make, you know, either out of guilt or shame, make very radical changes and they don't last long. Yeah. Oh, well, do you want to regale us with one story that really affected you at studying animal behavior just to, just to hammer it home, hammer. I mean, I love the magpie funeral or like, what else have you observed out in the wilderness with these beautiful beings that we share the earth with? I, I've had, I have, I have so many stories. it's, It's unbelievable. The magpie funeral was interesting. So here's the deal. I was riding my bike back into Boulder and we came in from the north and we turned onto a side street and there was a, obviously a dead magpie in the middle of a circle of four or five magpies. Aww. So I was with a friend of mine named Rod who doesn't study animal behavior. He, I mean, he's interested and I'm glad he was there because he could validate what I saw. So we stopped and one bird pecked at the carcass and step back another did another did then they all flew off and brought back um pine needles and some leaves they placed it around the corpse and then almost imperceptibly they went they all went bowed their head and flew off so i published it and within a year because it takes time i probably had you know 50 or 75 emails i just two weeks ago got an email about it and a woman in outside of Toronto I believe sent me a video of a magpie funeral she observed some right so near Toronto and it was identical to what I observed I mean it blew my mind to be honest with you and and at the end of it I wrote it up and I emailed it to Rod and I said Rod is this tell me you know I'm open to the fact that I could over interpret it I'm over to the fact fact that I could see things I don't think I do, but I, I was so happy he was there so that people didn't say, ah, oh, that's Mark. He always sees these things. <laughs> no. I mean, it was, and Rod, Rod was sitting there with his mouth open going, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, and at the end I said, wow, that's amazing. And he, Rod said to me, oh, you see that all the time. And I went, I've never seen that. And likewise, one night I was driving up to my house in the mountains and I saw a gray animal a, t- a tan animal running towards my car, and I thought it was my neighbor's German Shepherd. It was around mid- midnight. So I opened the door, and as I opened the door, the door kind of nudged into this tan being, and then I heard Lolo the dog barking behind my car, and it turned out it was a mountain lion who wow. had been coming down the road. So I drove home. I had to walk a couple of hundred meters to my house. I was I, you know, people said, oh, that's cool. No, there's nothing cool. I was scared, but I had my dog at home and I needed to get in. The next day I came out and I observed a fox funeral. It turned out that the uh, cougar had killed a fox maybe 100 meters down from my house. It turned out it was a male. There had been a mated pair of um, foxes living on my road for quite a while. So the cougar had killed the husband. And the female, his wife, was, she was sort of digging and then tamping down, digging, going around it, placing leaves, dirt, and uh, pine needles on it. And she did the same thing. It was a beautiful little tomb. And then she just sat there and went and took off. And so, so I never would have seen that if, if, you know, if, you know, the cougar, and the cougars around my house a lot. So, but had not, you know, if I wasn't alerted to the fact there was a cougar there, and when I came out, it was about five o'clock the next morning to walk Jethro, my dog, <laughs> I, I knew there was a cougar around, and he, he, you, you feel it. You don't need to know anything more than they're around, and you imperceptibly smell their presence. And I froze, and Jethro was right next to me because he was never on a leash. He probably didn't have a collar on because didn't need it. And he stopped. And then I looked down the road, and there, that's where I saw this whole funeral ritual. So 
Wow. In terms of observations that really move you, you know, I've seen coyotes and wolves play and penguins play. But for some reason, it was those two funeral services, if you will, that moved me because it's not surprising that a lot of animals feel joy and happiness. But and, and we know they feel grief, but to actually see it expressed, it, I could, it blew my mind. And then I was in Samburu in northern Kenya, and I was out with um, a researcher named Doug, um, Ian Douglas Hamilton, who's a very famous elephant researcher. And we walked out to some of the herds, and as we drove through one of the herds, all the elephants were walking around with their heads down and their trunks down, their tails down. You could feel something was wrong. And I said, Ian, what's going on here? And he said, the matriarch, the oldest family, who's kind of like the social glue for the elephant herd, had just died. Oh, wow. And a kilometer down the road, all the elephants were happy-go-lucky. And you could, no, seriously, I remember to this day, I, I, could, I could feel the whole, I could feel their grief. They were totally lost. Where... Where is our leader? And in elephant herds, it's usually one of the oldest, if not the oldest female. They can be up to in their mid-60s. She died, and the rubber bands broke, the glue dissolved, and these animals, were they were on their own, and they had no idea what to do. Wow. Oh, unbelievable. I could listen to these stories of yours for hours, and I do. I, I, that's how I found out about you. I Google you. I listen to you. I read about you. Your, your observations of the animal world and our beautiful world are just absolutely amazing. I am so grateful for you, Dr. Beckoff, Dr. Mark Beckoff. Um, you guys can read more about Dr. Mark Beckoff just like I do by Googling him. Tons of videos on YouTube, including this one. And Rewilding Our Hearts is an incredible new book that he just came out with, along with The Animal's Agenda. And one of my favorites, Why Dogs Hump and Bees Get Depression. <laughs> so if you want to know all those answers and uh, all about the animal world, which relates to our own inner and outer worlds, please check out Dr. Mark Beckoff. You are a true hero in my mind and my heart. Thank you, Dr. Beckoff. Thank, Thank you, you so Abby. much. You're so amazing. I've loved this time with you. Thank you for enlightening us and sharing your wisdom and your love for animals and humanity and the earth. And keep carrying the torch of truth. Thank you for doing what you're doing with your life. I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.